I think we're live now. Um, we started a little late, so I want to thank you for your patience in advance. If you're just tuning in, I'm going to give uh, folks a chance to refresh and uh, click um, our YouTube channel to join us. Uh, we are waiting for our book club participants at the Spady Museum to get settled. Uh, so as we wait for them to get ready, uh, they'll actually patch in. We're, what we're doing is a um, sort of a Google on air hangout with uh, some readers and museum lovers uh, in Delray Beach. Uh, and so this is a first time kind of collaboration program. Uh, this is also our first time going live in any capacity. So um, it always makes me think of um, like television shows, how different it is when it's live. Um, cause it's like the cameras is rolling. So if you uh, make a mistake or get, you know, ain't no bleeper real, um, live and it's all in real time. So, uh, bear with us as uh, we figure out all the kinks. So the, uh, folks at the Spady are getting settled. So I want to welcome you, get comfortable. Um, this is just an introductory, um, meetup for the book club. Um, there's a really, really fantastic uh, art exhibit going on at the Spady Museum in Delray Beach. Um, it's called Decolonizing Refinement and it is work by um, Edward Edward Duval Carey, um, who is a, um, a Haitian um, artist uh, living in Miami. And um, so his current work that's um, in the exhibition at both the Spady and uh, at the University Galleries at FAU um, is very much inspired uh, by this novel. And so we're going to read this together over the course of two months. And today's the kickoff for that. So when the Spady is ready to join us, uh, we'll kind of start. You'll be able to meet the readers at the Spady. And then, of course, uh, most of you know me, Cherie L. Greer, the founding director of Kitchen Table Literary Arts. Uh, so I'm looking forward to a really great program. So we're going to give uh, folks at the Spady a chance to get settled and then we'll get started. So I think they're still getting set. Okay, they're getting set. I think y'all can see it. Um, it's like a full house over there. Um, so that's exciting. So yeah, so they're getting ready. Um, I see... Um, I see Peaches, my sister Peaches is tuned in. Uh, my niece, Darmesius Dharma is here. Um, they're saying I look cute, hey. <laughs> so um, I think they're doing a little intro and then uh, we'll be getting busy. Um, I actually read this book. Um, so I see uh, quite a few folks is joining us. We got some viewers. We've got um, Peaches Greer in the house. Uh, we've got Dharma, that's, um, that's my family. So that's real sweet, tuning in for me. They talking about how cute I look. Okay, hey. Um, so I actually read this book in one day, not too long ago. And um, I really loved it because, um, um, it was as I'm instantly thinking of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, and the first book I've ever read by him was The Hundred Years of Solitude. And then 
this uh, brilliant short story collection called The Leaf Storm. And what I love about the work is it uh, uses magic realism. And so we're gonna talk about magic realism today and about um, how it is used in this book. Um, uh, Gabriel Mar uh, Garcia Marquez is actually influenced by Alejo uh, Carpentier. So um, yeah, so it's gonna be really exciting to talk about. Um, this is actually a newer translation. So if you get this copy of the book, it's one of the newer ones. Um, and there's uh, probably, I think, a good two or three, maybe four translations out um, of this novel. So um, let me check in with them again and see if they're getting ready. I think so. This is weird. Since this is our first time going live. All right. So they're getting ready over there, getting settled, um, and they'll be joining us soon. Again, I want to thank you for your patience, this being our first time uh, going live and our first time trying to have uh, a book club live, um, virtual, um, thinking about how technology can bring folks together across uh, time zones and in space and you know, Delray Beach isn't that far from us, but probably about like four hours or so. Um, but it's it's cool to be able to bring folks together in this way. So I'm excited. So if you are turning tuned in, you can uh, do live chat. Uh, so you can um, submit questions and I've got my eye on uh, my screen over here. So I'm able to read your questions and respond to them online. As we talk with the folks in Delray, we're gonna get a chance to meet them. So um, yeah, I think we're about to get started. Ah. <laughs> okay, so Cherie, we've gone off mute now. And Wonderful. Yes, so please, okay. um, please um, remember that we need to like, it's, it could be a little muffled here and there, but um, the last of our members are strolling in. And we talked mm -hmm. about how we want the book club to look. Yes. Okay. And so um, we're officially live. I gave a primer to the folks who are tuning in. Um, ready to go. Okay. That I'm not aware. Um, I have no understanding of that. So we're just signing in. Okay. But we don't, there's a lot of technology happening right now. So 
A lot of technology. Yeah, I can I can imagine. So can Can y'all hear me okay? We got double digit viewers. That's exciting. <laughs> Hello, viewers. <laughs> So, Sharia, I introduced you briefly, but um, would you please in introduce yourself? I'm sure it's going to be much more dynamic if you do that. Because I said, hey, she's awesome. You know? <laughs> oh, well, I agree with that. But <laughs> um, so, I kind of I did a, a mini introduction uh, to our live audience. Um, my name is Sheree El Greer. I am the founding director of Kitchen Table Literary Arts is a literary arts organization uh, both here in Tampa. Uh, we do work to support and showcase uh, Black women and women of color writers. Um, and we'd love to partner with uh, like-minded organizations for public programs that kind of span beyond or through our mission and beyond. And so um, it's a pleasure to partner with this lady, uh, this book, uh, this I'm calling it an adventure or like a journey because we're using technology in a way that I have yet to use. And I just think it's really amazing to be able to uh, sort of cross these miles um, with technology. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. Um, I, I also uh, am a writer um, and an educator. I teach uh, creative writing and I teach literature at St. Petersburg College. Uh, so what I want to tell the audience uh, that has tuned in is that we get to know our readers a little bit. Um, and so uh, has, has anybody uh, participated in a book club before over at the Friday? Have any of you participated in a book club before? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, with book clubs, kind of, you kind of form a, a sort of pseudo family of sorts all around having a shared experience of literature. And one of the things I love about literature is that it brings people together in this way that um, we're gonna share this experience and the story is gonna touch each of us in different ways, but all of those ways are gonna connect us since we'll be all responding uh, and all reflecting on the same experience of reading. And so that's one of the reasons I love book clubs or book discussions and things of that nature. So uh, to get to know um, to get to know you, since we'll be meeting uh, over the course of two months, we'll be meeting again. So if you could just introduce yourself, if you want, and a little bit about why you chose to join the book club and, and what, uh, or even what the last book you read or the last thing you read, get to know you a little bit. So I'll let y'all decide how y'all want to start over there. You sound like you want to start. Can you see? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'm Ivy. Irene. Irene. Oh, and um, we usually come here for um Ten Club. We've been here for a book study. We've been here for like three years now. I've been struggling like forever. So, um, and the reason why, um, first of all, I support space with the membership, and that's very important. And secondly, too, <laughs> and secondly, too, the tour that was given with Pat Kwanzaa, um, the last Saturday in December, um, we went up to see the exhibit over at Spady, and it was eye catching and just mind altering and I had to to, to to read this book and the last book that I read was The Destruction of Black Civilization 
I uh, and um, it seems like this decolonization is kind of going along the same line of colonization. So, so that's why I'm interested in reading this book, which is twofold. All right. Okay. <laughs> we might go to slow around. And um uh, and um I just I just moved down to Florida permanently now. And um my friend Julie has been coming to Spady and she's been to the Spady first time. We met up for a lot for the first time about two weeks ago. And um, when I was in New York, I made friends with some second generation Haitians, and now that I'm here, substituting, I'm finding myself with some very young second generation Haitians. And I did learn to speak French when I was in like, high school and college, and I'm pretty old, the youngster. Right. <laughs> it's the only way to so reach them. Mm -hmm. Give them French and they snap out of it and say, something is here. So, so you, I'm really curious as to what's going on in Haiti. Like, and so you, you can, you can, you'll be able to help us with some of our pronunciation. I'll take it to school. <laughs> 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 Where are you studying? Well, I've been working at uh, Orchard View. <laughs> I'm looking to anybody if anybody needs a substitute. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Julie Pino. I'm a New York City. I've um, lived in Florida for four years. And we were, we were, I was going to say bookies, but that doesn't have the same. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we actually are I run, I teach here and I run an after school music club that I put together. And this past year, I, this past term, I did what I call the cultural history on purpose because I don't know the nature of culture. And it's like, wait a minute, I can't get my head around this. Um, it's not easy for me to understand. So I, um, First went to the library to the office and started reading history of Haiti, among other histories of the start of America, who the conquerors were, you know, etc. But in my cultural history group, um, we did everything. We did, we did music, and we did their family stories, and we also did the history of their countries, of ancestry. So I had to learn a lot fast. I might have learned some things wrong. Um, but I think I'm going to give you something to unlearn later. So I forgive myself for being a little information somewhere. But um, I just, it's really helped a lot to do some research into some of Haitian history um, to, in order to teach it to this, the fourth and fifth grade kids in class. Because some of them know Christophe, Bob, him, or Cassandre, or but they don't know much. So okay. they don't know the story. So it's great that they get excited about it because they can recognize it and they're happy that that I all can tell who they are and where they're from or where they're from or something. So it's been a really joyful experience. And and my learning has led me to like deep depression over whatever happened to me. Being the first independent country of enslaved people. Um Mm -hmm. So that's, so I'm very happy to be here and, and gain perspective and to be more people and hone my knowledge based on the education culture. Okay. What's, um, what's really great about um, historical fiction is the opportunity to, to uh, the narratives and the narrative responses to what often is um, distilled into a timeline, right? 
And so in history, we look at history sort of objectively. We look at it in terms of events, um, historical figures, and what historical fiction helps us do is actually take a journey into how lives might have been touched and the, the narrative or the, the story behind those facts and figures. And so um, it's really great to bring that background to the discussion as well. So thank you, welcome. Thanks. Uh, Sherry, this is Mazzetta. Um, I'm gonna start with the this is just another journey for me. Uh, this one experience the book club. Uh, Charlene was instrumental in letting me know what's happening. I started with just attending a yoga class this morning and it's now expanded to this. So I'm happy about that. Yeah. So okay. I'm looking forward to this. I'd like to expand my horizons of learning. So I'm looking forward to this. It's all me. Okay, wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm Destiny Kinnell. I've been coming to Delray Bean for about 30 years. And um, we first came to the Spady Museum about 20 years ago with a group of uh, African American and white friends who came down here and we lived together for a week and we discussed big questions. I write historical fiction, but 20 years ago it was called the new historical fiction, which is not so new anymore, but revisionist, if you want. Including <laughs> many voices in the story, in our story. Okay. And I know there's a lot of people who are here who are deeply involved in this. Um, my textile trilogy is uh, takes place over the 19th century and looks largely at what we lost as a culture in the 19th century. We lost uh, community, we lost uh, um, we lost being able to create things without machinery driven by fossil fuels. You know, we lost a lot, but we gained the women's movement. We got that from our Native American sisters. So those are my stories. And you know, like uh, the rest of you, for me, history is story. And that's where it becomes interesting. I am Wonderful, thank you. I'm Linda Havelock, and I'm sitting this only temporary because I'm only here in January. I love this idea. <clears throat> I come from Massachusetts, Boston, and I was, I have been nurtured by our only, um, well, his wife, Ruth. Dr. Hugh Morgan Hill, who is a storyteller in Boston, Nurtured by Lilla storytelling. I've been down here visiting my parents over the years. I've never heard of the Valley Center. And I'm very excited to hear what people are doing. And I'm trying to get the book and the highway along. All right, wonderful. Technology. Oh, we get a little stuff. Okay. Well, okay. See y'all now. Okay. Uh, and I've been coming to those big museums uh, and remember uh, since I moved um, to here in Delhi for so almost two years. Uh, so I was uh, in the yoga classes here on Saturday morning, right here in the cottage, uh, and have been doing uh, genealogy work, uh, introducing people to African American genealogy. That has become a passion of mine. Uh, I was trained as a cultural anthropologist. 
psychologist, a physical educator. Uh, my last job was at uh, the University of Rhode Island, where I was helping uh, young students of color get into the healthcare field. Um, so I'm, you know, I've always been interested in books. Uh, and some of the programs I did, I did a also a programmer, administrator, educator, uh, all team. Uh, so I'm, I'm really interested in reading this book. Right this book I've been very um, uh, easy to get into. So uh, I, I really would appreciate having a group uh, discussion around this. It's uh, your type of history. So I, I really am looking forward uh, to that. I do. I'm going on to a book club here uh, at the uh, library downtown on Atlantic Avenue. And our last book was The American Marriage by Kayari Jones. Uh, yeah, it was, it was really a, a free and textbook by an African American. Wonderful. What's that? Yeah, so uh, yeah, it was a, it was a very interesting read. Uh, the group is uh, maybe about 15 or so members who come regularly. Uh, and they have been uh, a group for a long time, well before I got involved. But uh, so yeah, I've been a, a part of the book. So I, um, I'm also a co-editor of a book. Uh, the book is called um, "Women Are um, Gender Resistance: Women, Slavery, and the Legacy of Margaret Garner." Margaret Garner was the inspiration for Toni Morrison's novel *Beloved*. So this is uh, a quite a powerful story of a woman who could not be enslaved, even though uh, she had to kill one of her children to prevent them from being returned to slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to do a presentation at the library here for Herbine History Month. I'll be having a presentation about that book and another one on the genealogy as well. So yeah, I've, I've been involved in books uh, all my life. I would um, I would love to talk to you some more about the Margaret Garner piece. It's I believe I don't believe anything is uh, by accident, and I don't believe in coincidences. So my organization, Kitchen Table Literary Arts, we are finishing up our year of Toni Morrison here in Tampa. We read Toni Morrison uh, over the year, and today we are closing with uh, dinner and a movie. We're watching Beloved which is the little Toni Morrison wrote uh, based on uh, Margaret's story. So that's a that's that's an interesting little uh, connection here. So thank you. Hi. Hello, my name is Janice and I prefer to listen as opposed to talking more. Okay. <laughs> but I joined the book club because it has been a while since I have joined a book club and I miss it. I crave history about a wide variety of cultures and I <coughs> work with youth in the community and a lot of that population is unpaid. Um, so the better informed I am about where they're from um, can improve how I relate to them and how they relate to me. Um, and also to just get out more, to be a part of something. So, so that's why I'm here. All right, well, welcome, Janice, thank you. All right, everybody, I am Leslie Wilson. I am actually a local middle school teacher at Carver Middle School. <clears throat> I actually came back to the area about 12 years ago. I grew up in Boca Raton and Delray. Like I said, I've been back for about 12 years. My cousin, Charlene, it's the person who made sure I understood what was going on. And my daughter, LaDonna, was in the museum, made sure I know what was going on. But it's not just because of them that I'm here. Okay? <laughs> 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 I'm like, wow, I look bruising right here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm happy to be in the books. language arts teacher and English teacher um, in previous years, literature means everything, uh, being able to tell an effective story, being able to communicate effectively, and there uh, are young people in my life. So it's important to me to respect them, to honor who they are, their history, and I have found my eighth grade 
is that very few of them are aware of their history. Um, they don't always care enough or more about U.S. history, but they the kind of brokenness of family oftentimes within their community has prevented them from learning about their own history. Um, so it's always fascinating to uh, introduce them to things that relate to them and watch them get excited because they can know. Um, so I'm here to enjoy discussion, conversation, and learn more um, so that I can be a better teacher. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you. We have two more. All right. Oh, hi. I'm Levi. I'm Levi. I reside in uh, Broward County, but I was born in Jamaica. Lived there with several other um, several other islands in the Caribbean. Um, came to a Kwanzaa program here in December, and I uh, was invited over to to um, view the exhibit in the museum. And I was uh, motivated by the presentation there to join this uh, book club. So I'm going to be a lot. I'm going to be in a lot. I'm just glad to be here. My sister, one more thing. Uh, I, yeah, this is Dolores again. Uh, the motivation to be a part of this was um, also over the uh, various years, the kinds of exhibits that Kala has been putting together in this in the Spade Museum. Um, it's a not a big space, but she transforms it every each time into something absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I actually want to so Did you want to say something? Uh, I do. So our director, yes. the director of the Spady Museum. So I'm sure, sure all right. all of those of them just meeting. I am so glad you are here. I really am. Uh, this is going to be fun. First foray into a book club of this nature. And uh, I look forward to doing lots more of these. I have to second what uh, Dolores said about Kala. Since she has come into the life of the Spady Museum, that gallery space has never been more beautiful and more meaningful. And I, kudos, I, I thank God for her every day. Uh, she's very meticulous though. That's what makes her great. Uh, I read the book, full disclosure, I read it one time. Now I'm great. I'm happy to read it again because you're probably going to read it more than once because there's so much to uh, take in and um, you know you got to go through it a couple of times so you can get it all straight. So, but thank you so much for being here and woohoo! And thank you to Kitchen Table yes. for starting with us. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right on. I think I should add. Mm -hmm. And I actually visited Haiti in the mid 70s when Haiti Doc was out. <laughs> that was a rare privilege, really. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. So let's just, um, I just will say something very briefly here. Um, Thank you so much for uh, expressing appreciation for the exhibitions that we've recently had. Um, there's no way to have exhibitions unless there's amazing content already out in the world. And I love that Edward has, you know, done excellent research to access this book and to create visual imagery that, um, you know, we can pair with literary, with literary really amazing and you know full disclosure like Charlene said I have read the book 
Oh, but I'm so excited to, you know, go through this journey of reading it again to this group. You know, and I think that it's really important to share these experiences. So I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sharif, it's all you. It's all okay. You. Okay. It was, it was wonderful to meet all of you. Um, just like Charlene and Carla, I had read this book before. Um, I was telling our um, viewers who were tuned in to uh, to our, our YouTube live before we started the, the chat, um, is that I read this book in a day, I think it was. Um, I had come down uh, to visit Carla. Um, she's one of my oldest and dearest friends. And um, I was actually coming, I, I saw the Spady for the first time, loved the space, felt the moment I walked through the door that I was gonna work with the Spady again. I didn't know how, I didn't know when, and then here we are. Um, but I read the book in a day and I'm excited to read it again because um, uh, another, another writer I admire, Kiese Lehman, he recently you haven't really read a book unless you've read it twice. And so walking through I think um, open up even more nuances that I did that first time. So what I wanted to do for us today is do just like an introduction of some things that I want us to keep in mind as we're reading. So I want to, I think you all have a handout in your uh, back. So I just want to talk a little bit about the author to start. So we all have two handouts. We have one that just has the title up top and then we have one that has the schedule on it. Which handout are we looking at? The uh, introduction, the kingdom of this world that just has the title up top. So this one? Yeah. Yep, that's the one, this one here. So just a little background on the author. Uh, Alejo Carpentier was, um, he was born in Houston, uh, but he grew up in Cuba. Um, and what's interesting about uh, the author's relationship with uh, both Cuba and Haiti um, is that he did a couple of what one might call sort of like expat, um, where he, he would uh, leave, uh, particularly for uh, political asylum a couple times, uh, because for him, um, his art and his interest and in his life always straddled that um, intersection of the personal and political. I'm sorry, the, the um, you're breaking up a little bit. Once he, once he, as he's come to age in, uh, in Cuba, he's aligning himself with groups of young white. Okay. You're breaking up a little bit, Sheree. So we're looking at the intersection between Cuba and other Caribbean islands or IT. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the question of the public, of the personal and the political. And so looking at the intersection between um, one's personal identity, personal beliefs, and how those intersect with uh, the politics of a time, for example. 
Um, and so um, our author is coming of age during this time of uh, revolution, unrest, political action, um, and all of these things that are happening around him are informing the way he engages with art, which is something that was really important to him uh, growing up. And so while he's in Cuba, he is connecting with a group of other young writers. Um, and they're basically just kind of exploring the political landscape, but through the lenses of music, uh, poetry, and fiction writing. Um, and so he was very much interested in researching and discovering the origins of story um, and the traditions that have have either served a people well, had to be abandoned in, uh, in the name of He was really just kind of obsessed with um, uncovering the history and, and the origins of, of culture um, and um, the historical context that gave way to the stories we tell about our heroes, um, about our lineage. And so um, I forget who it was, um, that talked about um, doing uh, some work with genealogy. And so even for our author, uh, Carpentier, he is interested in um, ancestral roots as well and how those play into um, how a story may become a myth or a legend or just how stories are retold and retold with each generation what is added to those stories, what is taken away from those stories. Um, and so that is part of his aesthetic in uh, both his, his fiction writing um, and uh, his, he wrote a lot of uh, operas and he was very much into music as well. Um, uh, I mentioned also to, uh, as we were getting started, um, uh, Carpentier's work, really um, delved into um, or is informed by what we call magic realism. Um, has anybody read uh, any other works that have included, um, uh, anybody read like fantasy or, or sci-fi or anything like that already? Yes. 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 Okay. Real, right? I'll take sci-fi. <laughs> Also, um, Isabel Allende writes. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And so, well, what do you notice? What do you notice about books like that? Well, one of my favorite books that I used to teach to my um, at the time I was seventh grade is by um, Orson Scott Card, The Redemption of Christopher Columbus, and it's a okay. Okay. of what mm -hmm. would occur if Christopher Columbus never went back to record what he had found. And um, forgive me if this messes the story up, but in the end, he does travel back with an armada of ships of the natives of that land to introduce themselves to Spain and to Europe and to England. And it is an absolutely fascinating story. The Redemption of Christopher Columbus. It, it's, that's the, um, Subtitle. I can't remember the actual title, but that's the part that matters to me. <laughs> the redemption <laughs> of Christmas. It is absolutely fascinating because it's futuristic in that our world has used up all its resources and is getting ready. The human race will be soon extinct. And they have all this technology and they have the ability to project an image and send one person back. So they project an image to Christopher Columbus to get him to believe the, the, the uh, an angel is telling him what to do, but they also oh, send wow. him back to the Americas, of course that's not what you call it, to teach the Native Americans how to be what they will be. So when he gets there, they're ready to interact and, and they accept him. And it's it's really a fascinating novel by um, Horses Dot Card. Okay, so um, so what I was so what we're getting at here um, 
if you think about historical record, right, and what it means for someone to record an event objectively, uh, which I think is because it the the story is always tinged by the person holding the pen, right, and the the, the uh, um the perspective and the uh, what that is is what goes into the retelling of any historical event at once. It is on the one tell um tell a story that is steeped in reality, but understand that um that, that story contexts that are going to be are unbelievable or awesome in the way that the word is actually uh, the defined, right? Awesome, full of awe, stunning, uh, unbelievable, amazing. Um, and so what um, Carpentier has in his work is what he calls the marvelous real. And for him, what that meant was um, this sort of uh, marriage between uh, reality and dreams, or reality and fantasy, or magic. Um, and um, his work was uh, influenced by uh, surrealist artists. So if you think about um, like Dali, for example, and um, uh, portraits of actual people, but they'll have like um, just like dream like elements of it. Um, and so if we're thinking about how a story changes if we allowed magic uh, to be a part of that telling. Um, and, it's act, and it's also a part of, um, if we think about the, the book itself, which is also gonna delve into um, spirituality, uh, namely voodoo, um, that spirituality, at its core is about the intersection of the natural and the supernatural um, or the physical and the spiritual. And so the story itself is going to have all of those qualities. Um, and so what I wanted to ask you and get your thoughts on in terms of magic realism um, is on the handout it's about um, trying to be of the conquerors as well as the conquerors. And so that then is how do we tell us that's going through out the expressed and the experience of the oppressors at the same time. And so what Carpentier and what magic realism is saying is that the only way to tell that story, the only way to encompass that duality is through magic realism. Um, and if um, is steeped in the understanding or the acceptance of the unbelievable um, or the supposedly unbelievable, how, how do you think that that is a fitting approach to tell a story about the Haitian Revolution? If we want to... We want to make space for the unbelievable. How is how is that fitting to tell the story of the Haitian Revolution? I, I just like to say that you can't be in Haiti without feeling the influence of Abdon, however you want to say it. Um, and so for me, that reality and the magic of it have got to join to create the space to tell the story of the Haitian people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something? Uh, as part of our history venue, um, I looked for folk tales and I couldn't find very many in any public libraries uh, from Haiti. Very few, very limited. And I got them from other people, but also online, um, I was able to find one, a really particularly interesting one to me because it did just that. It was really um, voodoo-centric, 
and still a folktale and still um, culturally relevant. And it was just really very magical watching the way it was done on YouTube, on video, um, through, uh, through my animation and artistically. It was beautifully done um, that did exactly that. It actually blended the magic and the cultural realism of practices and beliefs of voodoo and into the whole history culture so that was exciting so that kind of makes me more interested in getting started in this book like now that you brought that okay. up <laughs> okay i think that uh i think the issue that i'm having is that i've never read magic realism before a straight non-fiction history reader okay so I'm having a little trouble with the definition of, of, of magic realism because I'm not quite, um, because I know about the Haitian Revolution and to incorporate magic realism into the Haitian Revolution and what would Haiti be if there was a different timeline is, is what you're asking. No, not not that it was not not a different timeline. So and I and I guess that actually leads into how we can hold space for magic realism. So if we look at the Haitian Revolution, um and and just for example, the in the novel, uh Bookman is a character. And so in terms of historical reference, we know that he is sort of the central figure that led the Haitian Revolution. Well, there's also that understanding that part of what made the uprising happen what brought um, the conditions together to make it successful um, was the infusion of spiritual help from the ancestors, uh, from uh, perhaps uh, sacrifice uh, through um, and, 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 and Buddha ritual to be specific. Um, the help of um, deities, spiritual tradition. And so in telling the story or reading, what we're looking at is the old space, not just the of individual existing illusion happen, so holds magic that helps this happen. Um, is a few of this novel as one of the characters, um, uh, Mac Macandel, um, who is a uh, spiritual leader in this, in the, in the book, and he has magic tendencies. He's able to shapeshift. He's able to uh, change his form. Um, and so part of what makes the, the reading of the book a little difficult, particularly if you haven't read magic realism before, is if you, if you read a, a paragraph that talks about uh, T. Noel, who's the main character, um watching Mac and Dell turn into a bird, you have to accept that T Noel just said Mac and Dell turned into a bird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um and, and so and so that's why I like to open the conversation in in what ways is believing in the part of this narrative of revolution. For example, um, I can't fathom what it must have been like to be an enslaved person. But I have to think that for many people, the thought of ever being free felt unbelievable, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the idea of owning own home of living outside of oppression 
had to feel impossible. And so how can you get closer to believing something that you haven't seen, um, which is the essence of faith, the spiritual concept. concept. And that's what magic realism is about. It's wow. about for the physical things that, and touch and hear holding space for the magic or the spiritual part of it so easily explained. I um, perceive the magic realism in the book as a bridge between the practitioners of voodoo and those who not only don't practice, but don't even understand. So what it did for me was it helped me to kind of begin to understand the connection of a people to the land that their ancestors lived on. My father once told me growing up, no one can control you until you take in, you ingest what they give you. So I'm thinking about the natural environment of pain, the practice of voodoo, the use of the natural environment in that practice, and the faith and belief that the people have in what they are experiencing, which could be, and we have to open up our minds, the result of any number of things that cause them to experience things, okay? So the magical aspect helps the non-believer um, imagine, yeah, imagine what these people may think they're experiencing. That's what it did for me. So it kind of helped create a little bridge there between what I'm used to experiencing and what Rumi practitioners experience and maybe where we can kind of come together and I can kind of begin to understand the faith that the people have in their religious practice. So without giving away so much, because full disclosure, I already read the book too. So <laughs> intentionally trying not to speak too much, Charlene. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm ready to <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the original questions you were asking is, you know, I don't know if you used the word appropriateness of of this magic realism being a, um, a good way to explain the story, to to set the story, that be the setting or or have the connecting pieces for this story being told. And along the lines of what Charlene was saying is, you know, when you talked about faith, when people do not know how to believe that they can be something other than what they are. And a practitioner of any sort, the, the person who's doing the priest, the, priest the, the minister, whatever, starts trying to inspire them and encourage them that they can be, then they do pull in aspects of what they know, the land. Mm -hmm. They know the land. So we must use this to help you identify with the idea you can be more than what you already are. Mm -hmm. So you know what the, the land can do. You know how it works. You know what sun, rain, fertilizer, seeds, you know all those terms, you know the experience, you know depth, you know, you know, you all so they pull that in to to help you imagine you can be something you have never imagined you could be. That's why it's so appropriate for it to be uh, magic realism. Um, to to express this because as a reader who yeah. is clueless about voodoo, that's the way I can understand it. I can understand yes. how the characters are doing what they do and why they're doing what they do because it's magic realism and it's a way to connect them to the impossible, to the unbelievable. <laughs> To relate. Like we study in Sankofa, in our connection to the land and our disconnection. Mm -hmm. And I like yes. that it brings us to the animals too. Animals, What's, um, yeah, everything. Yeah. 
So I'm not, I, I'm not sure which um, translation you are, but um, if you have the one with the introduction by Andrew Dantica. Yes. Um, We're all reading from the same text, I think. Oh, yeah. perfect, perfect, perfect. So on page uh, eight, introduction. Um, and I, I highly recommend you read it before you start um, the book. The paragraph that's at the bottom of the page in the kingdom of this world, what Dante Kyle does here in this section um, and on to page nine is talk about how, how the book is going to use actual actual historical figures almost as guideposts to ground the the reality of the story but then we also have um fictional characters who are added um and then we also have this whole story being told through the point of view of t noel who um if you if we want it, he, he's, a, he's an observer, but he's also an actor in the, in the action of the story. And so the way that he is inviting us into his version of events involves the fact that he does believe in the connection of the supernatural and the natural. Um, in people, um, Toussaint Louverture, who was, um, he was one of the leaders of the, of the slave revolt revolution. Um, he was a list. He was um, into with the lands, uh, herbs, uh, creatures of the earth, of both, right? Was Bukman, who was a priest, a voodoo tree, who sort of imbued power in Toussaint in order to kind of make him, I guess, uh, superhuman, um, to take the to take the the power and the knowledge that he had as the herbalist, as, the, as this man of the natural world, and give him power to become supernatural. And that kind of supernatural power is what um, believers would say move the needle to make the revolution, to make the uprising that much more. Um, and so, well, what I really like about that particular section of the introduction is that it invites us to begin to see how the story is gonna use real characters alongside fictional characters in the same way that magic realism is going to use reality right alongside spirituality and magic and fantasy. That's interesting because it's like you're taking both sides of my mind. You're taking the logical part and you're taking the creative part. Mm -hmm. And you're and you're melding them together. Mm -hmm. That's hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I I get it, but it's just it's it's just uh, different because those two don't go together, you know. And usually, like if you put um, realism with um, um, uh, magic, that's uh, that's not usually like a, a, a web that's interwoven. It's usually just historical fiction, or to me, yeah. it's just either historical or it's nonfiction fiction. Yeah, that's it. There's no in between. I'm like you, where that's what you, you'll be on the same where I read a lot of those kinds. Yeah, yeah. So it's hard, but we're so concrete. And yeah, we're so factual. Yeah, yeah. The information. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so look at beyond that. <laughs> yeah, I'm like you. I read a lot of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, however, if you're saying Tucson was really a herbalist, if that's not the part of him that you usually hear about, right? So right. in this book, if that's that part that comes out prominently with T. Noel, that's 
that made you understand a little bit more about the actual history that wasn't really, you know, that wasn't really shared before. Okay. Uh -huh. so, uh -huh. so exactly. Maybe that helps, it helps in that way. Yeah, right. just because read that. Because mm -hmm. what is documentable and what's not. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. like, a lie. It's not true. But yeah. I it takes a taste of, you know, some aspect of what you're reading that has not been shared right. before. And while it's not saying, stating plainly this and that occurred, it helps you to imagine, imagine. what, to fill in the gaps for yeah. yourself in terms of the history. Okay. And that's what makes it fascinating. Okay. Which is what we do anyway. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. true. That's what we do. We project our ideas and some of what we think we read or know or heard. Yeah, it's it's human nature to fill in gaps uh -huh. what, from what we see to what we think, uh -huh. from what we, what we heard or thought we heard. If we just we decide that it is this, because that's just our nature. As an educator, I know that history can be a hard pill to swallow. If not presented in a a fun and exciting way. And one of the things I enjoy about historical fiction, it makes my students curious about real history. Because they read, they read a story like the Judge of Christopher Columbus, yeah. and now they want to know within what actually what actually happened. Really this yeah. is so fascinating, but what actually happened? Yeah. And I said, we live, we're living what actually happened. Uh -huh. <laughs> of how to approach the sort of um, both ends, right? If we, if, and this is where it can, this is where a lot of um, literary criticism and uh, criticism historically <laughs> comes through is, can we, can we trust any his, historical narrative um, to be, you know what what is our understanding of objectivity what is our understanding of what really happened and according to whom right um and so we say well we have trouble holding holding space for uh the facts of a matter right and someone's telling of a matter at what point do we Try to kind of jive those those versions into what really happens, right? Yeah. Um, um, how much uh, how much fiction is in the history that we? sort of continue to, to push forward, right? And at what point do we say um, that couldn't have been how it happened or we never heard this side of the narrative? Um, thinking about how, and I think it's it's hanging up in the, in the, in the spadey about the, the story being told of, uh, from the hunt, right? <laughs> This this concept of when we talk about history, talk about particularly the thing or uh, war. That is 
the perspective that you that asked, right? Got some. Um, so, I, so, so, yes. Because I, I looked it up. I did read The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. Yes. Does, yes. Does, does that include or involve magical realism? Um, it can. So, magic realism is, um, literally speaking, it's primarily housed in uh, Caribbean and uh, Latino culture, um, literature. Um, and so, I'm of the opinion, um, as a writer and also um, as a as a uh, not so much a literary critic, but a, a educator who, who who works in literature. I think that magic realism has, at, at this point, has definitely expanded across cultures. Like I wouldn't say that just because um, the writer, him or herself, is of uh, Caribbean descent or uh, Latino de Latino descent that that makes theirs magic realism, and if someone else does it, it's something else. Um, so I would absolutely put Underground Railroad there. I would also sort of put some of the um, revision literature that we're seeing uh, that I think uh, was referenced uh, earlier too. Um, uh, the idea that you're going to infuse or or sort of infuse imagined events or imagined people. Um, yes, absolutely, into the telling of something. So sitting, and if, and if this declaration as a, as a blend, um, that when you're including anything into uh, a literary telling, fit that magic realism mode. I would have to say that for sure. So um, the magic realism is the, probably the first thing that makes uh, this book difficult to read at times. The second thing that makes the book a little difficult to read at times is the narrative structure of the book. And so that last point on our introduction is about the narrative structure in the book. And so our book has a main um, protagonist, and that protagonist is T. Noel. Uh, so he is he is telling us this story um, through his experience and his point of view. Um, but the book is not written in a straightforward uh, chronological um, kind of linear structure. And that's the other thing that makes it a bit difficult at times. Um, and so what this book uses is what's called tableau. And a tableau is, it's, it's like a, a scene or an image or an, um, a moment in the, in the narrative of a narrative telling which is going to it might seem small we're having some technical difficulties and uh inaccurate sheree if you can hear me can you hear me but it actually is a stand-in for some. If you can hear me, can you hear me? We have a little technical difficulty. If you can take a moment and just repeat the last thing you said, that would and be so. As if, um, okay. I'm trying to think of the best way to. Got it. People that look where if Julian sent folks over to try to the fighting. Um, and sort of okay, I can hear. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, now. I can hear but, you now. Yeah. Okay, okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're having some technical difficulty. So you said, uh, I think, a couple of things that were probably very important to hear that we missed because we're having yeah. a little bit of a uh, streaming difficulty. Okay. Um, so we have some solutions for the future. Okay. 
I was just talking about the, um, so the magic realism is sort of the first hurdle for reading through it. And so um, the second hurdle is the structure of the book. And so that paragraph in the introduction talks about the narrative structure of the book. The last paragraph on your on yeah. And so it says that the um, the book is not told in a traditional linear narrative structure. Um, and so it's not played strictly chronologically. Um, so what Carpentier does is he, he uses what's called tableau to construct the narrative journey. And so the narrative isn't so much as um, it's not so much like a straightforward, this happened, then that happened, then I said this to him, and then she said that to me. Um, it's actually, the story is gonna be told almost in um, stages or like big events. Um, some of which are you're gonna know there. Other times, couple sentences represents big that happened. And that's that hurdle we're gonna have. But the good together, um, so we'll be back in with each other on the same page forward. Uh, so the thing in the novel are presented in large scale scenes or in um, uh, images. Um, presented symbolically or metaphorically. Uh, so as to say, uh, particularly like when we get to the part where they're having the secret meetings, um, that might be, you know, described as, you know, shadows rustling in the trees. And it's like, why we keep talking about these shadows rustling in the trees and then the shadows rustling in the trees is the secret. <laughs> and so the, Tableau is, is when you use metaphor and symbol um, rather than just like straight narrative uh, to tell a story. And so that part's gonna be, make things a little bit more complicated as well. Y'all ready? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready for the first read. Gotta make it a little easier. Now. Oh, yeah. Shereen, question. Yeah, so the thing, thing to remember, I, I think if uh, I wanted to end with to end with a few tips okay a few tips kind of through, even if it starts to get confusing um and the first is something that i offer whenever um i have a whenever we're we're reading literature Okay, we lost you. We didn't hear any of that. Tips. We didn't hear that. Two tips I have. You want to always hear on its own and believe everything that the right page is to enter the story on its own terms. Okay. So you want to you want to enter the world that the author has constructed 
on its own terms. So we're entering a world that Carpentier has built for us. And we want to, um, instead of trying to make sense of it based on what we think should be, we want to accept what is presented on the page. <laughs> so that's going to be the challenge. We want to believe that everything the writer has done was done on purpose. And we want to accept, uh, we want to lose ourselves in the world that the writer is constructing. And so um, that's that's the first tip. The second tip is to what? Say again. What's the second tip? Oh. The second tip is to uh, have a, we all have a, a touch point for the story. So no matter how crazy it gets, no matter how Strange it gets. Remember that the story is about the Haitian Revolution. And so you might, uh, maybe you could do research alongside it, but if pause, you want to just keep looking for those footholds in the story of the revolution. And it is to remember that it is. It is a, so it rep a different telling what you in you know than some Britannica off or under Tucson um, thing that are uh, and it uh, lose uh, let the world that the the book is representing sort of come alive for us. We don't want to read it in opposition to the story that's being told. If that makes sense. And then I do, I do encourage, uh, I encourage uh, note taking and um, jotting down questions to bring to our next uh, meeting, because that's what makes the discussion so rich, is that we each bring with us um, what we noticed, uh, what made us think a little deeper about either something um, from the history or even something that we are noticing uh, in terms of uh, cultural or his or or cultural context now, social context now, uh, because part of studying literature and reading literature is about Part of studying literature and reading literature is about Bridge one, one two. Say that part again. This is the most important thing we ever right? That's why we're all hanging on the cliff. Are you there? <laughs> Well, we could imagine her. You're frozen on our screen. If you That's can like, hear me. This is like the key to <laughs> all existence. <laughs> I, I'm y'all breaking up. You breaking up? Am I BS? So wait, Cherie, can you can you go back and tell us the key to studying and something that you're reading? The the key to studying and reading literature. Mm -hmm. Actually, Sheree. Yes. You want to go ahead and tell us the last uh, key point, and then I would like to just put you on the speakerphone on my cellular phone, if that's okay. Yeah, that works well. That works well. So okay. I guess I guess the close. Um, I just want to encourage you to take notes 
uh, jot down your thoughts as you're reading, uh, questions you have as you're reading, things you want to bring to the group, um, things that are going to bridge the, the historical context and the cultural context of the novel and bring it into a real-time conversation with all of us here. Um, so for our next uh, meetup, we'll be talking about parts one and two, uh, but I do encourage you to read the introduction uh, by Ewi Dantaka and of course the uh, the preface, uh, preface, and then um, we'll be talking about parts one and two uh, next month. And okay. question. Yes. Confirm for me, will this entire session have been recorded and will it be available on your YouTube channel? Yes, when this closes, um, I will upload it to the um, Kitchen Table channel. Um, what's interesting, I have, I have my phone here with it. And I, I think don't, it, I don't yes. think it had the answer is yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> so is the answer yes? The problems that we can. Uh, I'll be interested to see the playback as, as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it might smooth it out. But it will be available um, online as will the subsequent conversation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, if for any reason you need to miss one. Okay. Okay. Yep, my suggestions from next time is that I call with her. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No video. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Looking forward to moving forward. How do you hang up? Hey. All right. Bye. Thank you. All right.